Hello and welcome to the Canary Brief. Black Lives Matter. Today I wanted to talk to you about the Black Lives Matter movement. A lot of people were kind of asking, hey, why did Bristol just throw this statue in the sea? And why are black people in Britain protesting when this is a thing that's happening in the United States? And how on, why on earth are these people going out and protesting during a pandemic? This is outrageous, they're gonna create a second wave. So today's Canary Brief is basically giving you the answers to those questions. And you may not agree with those answers, and that's your prerogative, but that doesn't actually impact their validity at all. The fact is all of these things are necessary and all of these things are right. And if this country had taken racism seriously, if we'd stood up against these racist attitudes a long time ago, these protests wouldn't need to be happening right now. So firstly, let's take a look at this damn statue. Edward Colston was a Tory MP and a massive slaver. This guy basically kidnapped 100,000 Africans, transported them to the Caribbean where they were gonna be enslaved. Those slaves then made it to the United States and to the United Kingdom. And so did all of the wealth that was made off their backs. Here's a little look inside the kind of ship that Edward Colston would have sent to Africa to transport those, those people, those human beings. And it's really important we don't call them slaves. They were enslaved people, like you and me, kidnapped from their homes and forced into labor, forced to become another person's property. And it's important to remember how long this journey actually took. This wasn't like a one or two day cruise that these these people were coming on in like tight cabins. People were shackled by their necks, their hands, their feet, their waists, crammed in. If they vomited, if they went to the bathroom, they lay in it for the duration of the trip, which could have taken weeks or months. And these are human beings. Can you even imagine what it would be like to be in that ship? Place yourself in the position of one of those black figures, shackled, in the dark, hungry, covered in your own feces, urine and vomit, utterly degraded, not understood. And if you happen to get sick, if you happen to attempt to resist, then what would happen was while still shackled, you would be tossed into the sea. 19,000 people died out of those 100,000 just making that journey. Dying of sickness or being simply discarded into the sea like so much trash. Despite this, in the 19th century, the white majority of Bristol decided that they would erect a statue to Edward Colston in the very centre of our city. And this wasn't some memorial to the horrors of slavery. The plinth to the Edward Colston statue reads, erected by citizens of Bristol as a memorial of one of the most virtuous and wise sons of their city virtuous and wise. For decades, people in Bristol have attempted to have this statue removed. There have been petition after petition. There have been protests. There have been requests. Every possible form of getting this thing down without physically tearing it down with our own hands has been made but it just simply fell on deaf ears because the majority decided it was more important to keep that statue in place. And so now the decent people of Bristol took matters into their own hands and they tore that statue down. Not only did they tear it down, but they then rolled it to Perrow's Bridge. Perrow's Bridge is the only piece of Bristol city that actually memorializes enslaved people. There are plenty of statues and buildings and streets that honour 
slave owners and slave traders. But Perrow's Bridge stands alone in memorialising an enslaved person, Perrow Jones. And so it was particularly moving to see that statue rolled up right into clear view of Perrow's Bridge and tossed into the sea. <laughs> For me, it was the most poetic, informed, historically significant act of anti-racism I have seen in my life. I cried. I'm almost crying now, just having it in my mind's eye. The relief, the almost euphoric relief that I would never again have to see that fucking statue and everything that it represented. I would never again have to argue with anybody about it. I wouldn't feel impotent at being unable to have my concerns listened to and acted upon. It just felt great. And it, I know it's gonna feel great for the rest of my life. And that's what it meant to see that statue go down. And so I say this very straightforwardly to any white person who wants to tell me that you sympathize with our cause, you understand our upset, but it's completely wrong to have pulled down that statue and tossed it in the sea. Where were you? You have had 40 years to get your shit together and take that statue down and you didn't. And now you don't get to be upset about us taking matters into our own hands. You forfeited that right when you just decided that your comfort level, your disinterest in politics, your acceptance of a racist status quo and all of the harms that it meets out to black and brown people in this country, all of that behavior disentitles you to an opinion on this. You can flap your gums as liberally as you choose, but times are changing and they're gonna change without you. We're not asking for permission anymore. That, that bit of this has been done. But it's important to remember that black people aren't protesting solely because of what happened in the United States or solely because of Edward Colston and the history of the slave trade in Britain. This is very much more contemporary than that. There is a dangerous misconception in the United Kingdom among mostly the white communities that what's happening to black people at the hands of US police officers doesn't happen here. That our police are different. And I hate to break it to you, but that is manifestly not true. And most black people in this country are cruelly aware of that. And it hurts not only that it's true, but that it is so buried by our media, by our culture, by this sort of arrogant belief that Britain is a post-racist country. This isn't a racist country. There might still be the odd issue here and there. Racism is an epidemic in our country. And if you don't realise that, that's because you enjoy the privilege not to have to. That is not the same for the rest of us. I'm just going to give you two cases today and then I would urge you to go and watch the film Injustice, which I will put a, provide a link to with this video. 
because I think it's really important now that we all educate ourselves in the reality of what's been happening and continues to happen in this country while most people simply sleepwalk through it. The first person I want to talk about is Joy Gardner. Now, Joy was 40 years old. She was a media studies student in London and she was an immigrant from Jamaica. At 20 to 8 in the morning on the 28th of July, 1993, police raided her home. On the surface of it, this was an immigration raid. Their plan was to deport Joy back to Jamaica, despite her having a five and a half year old son who was born in this country, despite her legal battle to remain, they were gonna get rid of her. But Joy never made it to the plane because the police made it up to her bedroom they attacked her in her own bed. They shackled her at the arms, at the feet, at the waist. They put her in something called a body belt. They gagged her and they proceeded to wrap 13 feet of tape around her head. And then they watched as Joy struggled and choked and gasped desperately for air until she lost consciousness and she would die several days later in hospital. And here's Joy's mum, Myrna Simpson, talking about that. My daughter, Joy, was killed by the police, mm. brutally, Brutal. murdered That's right. by the police in 1993, on the 28th of July. She was in her bed in Hornsey, North London, and uh, police officers, I think five police officers and an immigration officer broke down her door and went in on her in her bed while she was asleep with her child, my grandson, who was only about five and a half years old and killed her. They decked her and they put 13 feet of tape mm -hmm. around her face and they put on a thing by the name of the body belt and they put on something on her legs like she was a mad person and she wasn't mad. She was a normal human being mm -hmm. like you and I. Mm -hmm. She didn't commit any crime. Mm -hmm. She only overstayed her time mm -hmm. in this country. And she had lawyer going to sorting, yeah. sorting her out because she used to go to university as well. Mm -hmm. She was a university student and they killed her like that. And they didn't even tell me it was Bernie Grant they told and he sent a message to me is a message I got that my daughter was in the hospital and I thought she had an accident I didn't know my son he was about 16 then and he said to me that he is heard that Joy is in the hospital. So I say, what's wrong? And that was Whittington Hospital. And I thought she had an accident. I didn't know anything was wrong until when I went, I went straight away to the hospital myself and another daughter of mine went up to, to Whittington Hospital. And I saw police officers all around the hospital. And I was thinking what was going on. And when I went in, I saw my daughter on life support machine, but she was already dead. And they had her in foil, bacon foil, mm -hmm. and um, with all the different instrument on her. And I said, to, there was a doctor, and I said to the doctor, what's wrong? And he said to me, Mrs. Simpson, I'll tell you the truth. She hasn't got a chance. And I say, she's dead. And he didn't answer. Because from the time he said to me, she hasn't got a chance, I knew that she was dead. And they had her four days in the hospital, rotting in, in the hospital there. 
as if she was alive. And I slept on the hospital floor. Myself and a church sister of mine, we slept there every, for the four nights. I just used to go home to have a bath and come back. And uh, <clears throat> I spoke to a senior police officer and I said to him, what have they done to my daughter? Why did they kill my daughter? If it was your daughter, what would you have done? Why have they done this to her? You know, up until this time, I, I, I've blotted everything that she went through. I've blotted it out of my mind. I just can't think what she went through in front of her five and a half years. The officers responsible were never brought to justice. There was never a public inquiry. There was never a public inquest. Since then, there have been countless names. Jimmy Mubenga, Sean Rigg, Kingsley Burrell. There is a litany of names. But in 2015, there is another case, the case of Sheku Bay. And one of the most common ways that black people, particularly black men, lose their lives at the hand of UK police is when they're called for a wellness check when someone is having a mental disturbance. So it's now got to the point where black people are genuinely terrified to call for help if one of their relatives is suffering a mental break because in all likelihood they're signing that family member's death warrant. No duty of care whatsoever was given to him because he was a black man. That's how we feel. If he was a white man, I think things would have been handled differently. The Sheku had so many plans that he wanted to do with his children. All of that has been taken away. There was no need for Sheku to have died that day. We just want to know how our brother died, that's all. So they get there, they screech to a halt, they get out of the cars with, with uh, um, irritant sprays and batons. Um, that to me doesn't seem measured. Had they approached Mr. Bio in a different way, in a calming way, to try and find out what was wrong, then in my view, that attack may have been prevented. They do have an, a very difficult job to do. Um, and for that, they receive significant training. I can see no evidence at all of um, two stamping attacks uh, on the officer on the ground. Um, let alone two very violent ones um, that is described in the papers. It has made me lose faith in the police and the justice system as a whole. I don't think he would have died if he hadn't met. And here is his partner, Colette, addressing Scottish Parliament on the matter of gaining justice for her lost love. Not come into contact with the police, he would still be here. We would be a happy family, full of love and plans for the future. Instead, I am left without my soulmate and my best friend. Isaac is left without a daddy, all because of police brutality. At what point will the police be held accountable for their actions? At what point does somebody stand up and say this is unacceptable? Changes need to be made. This is now our struggle. This should not be anybody's struggle. Policies and procedures need to be looked at. Changes need to happen, whether it be a change in the law, additional training, better management of complaints made against the police, 
So in the case where an officer has numerous complaints against them, they are not able to carry on patrolling the streets. Most importantly, when there is wrongdoings made by the police, where if it was a matter of the public, doing, uh, a member of the public doing the same, the same charges would apply. It is completely unacceptable that no officer has been prosecuted, even when found guilty. When it comes to charges against the police, they are never charged. I just want answers, the truth, justice for my son. So when he asks me why he doesn't have a daddy, I can explain as best as I can and say we don't know we could hold the officers responsible, accountable. Surely that is not much to ask. In any other cases where someone dies at the hands of somebody, it is treated as manslaughter or murder. Why should it be different when the person or people are wearing uniforms? These are the points that we would like to raise and hope you consider. Thank you for your time. From joy to shack and all of the deaths in between, not one police officer has been held to account for any of these deaths. And black people are twice as likely to die in police custody than any other ethnic group. And you can watch the film Injustice or read a wide range of publications that detail the names, the ages and the stories of all of these black people who have been dying in police custody, which were largely ignored by the mainstream media and just don't make it into our common culture. And so the protests that you are seeing are not just about Joy or Sheck or Sean Rigg or Kingsley Burrell, or Jimmy Mubenga, or George Floyd. They're about our collective pain, our collective experience of being treated like second-class citizens in a country that broadcasts itself to the world as a shining beacon of democracy. And it is why it is no longer good enough to say, I sympathise with your cause, but. Because the but is ultimately gaslighting. We know full well, having exhausted every possible means of attempting to deal with this through the normal processes and procedures, that the normal processes and procedures are rigged against us. We do not have an independent judiciary. We do not have an independent police system. We don't have an independent parliament. None of these institutions are independent of racism. In fact, they are systemically and institutionally racist. They are designed to protect the people that hurt us, not to prosecute them. And so this change is not going to come top down by a law or a change of policy or even a change of government. This is going to have to be bottom up. We cannot wait for leaders to arrive. You are a leader, I'm a leader, we are all leaders. And together we can defeat racism. And we can shape our country into a place where you are judged on the content of your character and not the color of your skin. Those things are possible. And so as terrifying as this moment in history is, as uncertain as it is, and as god awful as I imagine the reprisals are going to be for these small victories to date, I am grateful to be alive to witness this and to be a part of this. And you should be too. Because what I'm seeing right now is humankind in transition. I have never experienced what I've experienced from white people during this phase of Black Lives Matter. I have never seen allies step up in the way that they are stepping up right now. Not tokenistically, not with guilt and shame, but with a genuine intent to understand what the lived experience of black and brown people is in this country and around the world, and to be responsible for addressing it as a problem for white people. It's not a favour to us. This is not a black person's problem. Racism is not a black person's problem. Racism is a white problem. And only white people can solve it. And so what is so enormously refreshing about this moment to me is watching white people have a conversation with white people about their racism. 
and listening to black people and standing with black people and refusing to be whipped up into a frenzy about fucking statue when black and brown people are dying, when they're being undereducated, over-policed, insulted, assaulted and killed routinely. Because that's the violence that we need to be getting angry about. That's the violence that we need to be making a stand against. Bronze lives matter? No. Black lives matter. If you're shielding or you feel unsafe, attending the physical process of Black Lives Matter, you don't have to sit this one out. You can read, you can watch, you can participate online. You can have radical conversations with your communities, your friends, your families, your workplaces. You can make it absolutely clear that at every minute of every day, you are an anti-racist. It is not good enough for you just not to be racist yourself. Your silent acceptance of other people's racism is complicity. And so to do the emotional labour of being the person in the room that says, that's not cool what you just said. What you just said was racist and it's really not acceptable. Don't leave it to the black or brown person. Don't look at them for guidance as to whether to let the thing slide or not. That is an enormous burden to place on a person who is already experiencing great anxiety and alienation in that moment. A great way to be a white ally is to do the emotional labor. Hold your friends to account, hold your families to account, hold your workplace colleagues and employers to account. Make it your problem. Because ultimately it really is. And that way, together, we can build a country worth living in. A country that we will feel proud to live in. And instead of feeling like, well, that just happened, we will have the pride as the generation that made it happen. As the human beings that were here in the moment, making the choices, that meant we took on racism properly and permanently. That is a privilege. And I would leave you with a note on privilege. I am a light-skinned black woman. I experience a privilege relative to darker-skinned black men and women. That is reality. And I recognise that privilege. It doesn't take away the fact of how harmful racism is when it happens to me and how frequently it happens to me. But it does mean that there are people relative to whom I enjoy privilege. Now, if I can wrap my head around that, if I can adjust to that, if I can be cognizant of that when I'm talking to people, when I'm listening to people, then for goodness sake, White people can too. So please stop it with the fragility. Stop it with the, yeah, but working class white people are treated just as bad as black people. No, you're not. That doesn't mean you're not treated badly, but it means you're not treated as bad as a poor black person. It doesn't mean your life has been without struggle. It doesn't mean your life has been without prejudice. It doesn't mean your life has been a stroll through a country field. It means that of all of your problems, your skin colour is not one of them. So I really thank you for taking the time to watch this today. Please share it. Please let it be a source of conversation for you, your friends, your communities. Help us, stand with us. And until the next time, bye-bye.